The only reason Doc didn't immediately panic and do something stupid was that Gravis chose that exact moment to try and die again. The nurse ran over to assist, and Doc began barking orders at, for lack of anyone else, the two security officers. Now, Doc may not have been a real doctor, but he'd gotten quite good at keeping Sergeant Gravis alive over the last few weeks, and that medical confidence infused his voice with doctorly gravitas. The two security officers stood there in shock for a second, and then, compelled by the voice of medical authority and the sight of an honest-to-the-emperor's space marine, well, half of one, lying on the table, they lowered their weapons and began helping too. Now, in an ideal galaxy, after they helped him save Gravis, Doc would have sent the two security goons off on some pointless errand, and they would have spent hours running around looking for a can of headlight fluid or elbow grease before remembering that they were supposed to be arresting him. What actually happened, though, was that halfway through the procedure, a whole mob of people burst into the storage room. Only three of the intruders were security grunts, the rest consisted of the other nurse, Sister Valerie, the station's head medique, and a very angry-looking man who turned out to be the head of the medbay security detachment. The room was immediately filled with yelling as the security commander started chewing out his men for swabbing the traitorous heretic's brow instead of arresting him. And the two men tried to defend their actions. At the back of the group, one of the newly arrived goons began relaying a report to headquarters. Another called for backup from one of the search parties. The third goon was stuck trying to placate the head Medicae and Sister Valerie, who were angrily demanding to know what all this talk of heretics and arresting was about. After half a minute of trying to get information out of the low-level security officer, Sister Valerie turned to the irate commander and tapped him on the shoulder. The commander, who was still busy shouting at the men who'd been helping Doc, responded with a rather rude remark, then ignored her. This is what we in the guard call a tactical error. With a little huff of annoyance, Sister Valerie jammed an injector into the security commander's neck and stalked past him with her nurse in tow. Behind her, the commander rocked from side to side, then crumpled to the floor. In the silence that followed, Sister Valerie shooed Doc away from Gravis and said she'd take care of the Space Marine while Doc dealt with all this silliness. Doc turned around and found himself facing a very shocked head medique, and three security officers who didn't have their weapons raised, but were obviously very angry. He briefly evaluated his chances of talking his way out of the situation, decided they were rather low, and raised the turkey baster-sized metal syringe full of liquid he'd just drained from Sergeant Gravis's oolitic kidney in the least threatening way he could manage. Then, in a surprisingly swift motion, Doc jammed the syringe's plunger down and hosed all three security troopers with tyranid biotoxin. The results were not pretty. None of the security officers had their faceplates lowered, and Doc managed to nail two of them right in the mouth. They were the lucky ones. It only took them a few seconds to die. The third officer got hit in the eyes and took nearly a minute. Sister Valerie looked up disapprovingly at the screaming and pointed out that what Doc had just done was both distracting and terribly unhygienic. Doc stammered an apology, both to the sister and to the three dead security officers, then turned to the two officers who'd been assisting him and were now backed as far away from him and his syringe as possible. After a few seconds of thought on the ethical and tactical problems raised by the whole hostage thing, Doc told the two terrified station security officers to collect their unconscious commander, as well as the catatonic with fear head medique, and get the hell out. Then, at Sister Valerie's insistence, he also shoved the three now-melting corpses out into the hallway. 
As an afterthought, he collected the dead officer's shotguns and ammo, set up a firing position using the sliding door and the sturdiest crate he could find, and thanked the Emperor that their storage room was at the end of a corridor. It should be noted, just for posterity, that Doc did not actually stop to check what was in the crate he used for this barricade. That really wasn't his fault, though. He was very busy with defending the room. It was an innocent mistake, and the tribunal did clear him in the end. Anyway, as Doc worked, he did his best to bring Sister Valerie up to speed. She did not find the news that the Astropaths had betrayed us surprising, and recommended purging them all in holy fire before we left. Doc made that agreeing but non-committal sound which comes naturally to all boyfriends, and skipped ahead to the part where they needed to pack everything up and hold out until backup arrived. Since by this point the security reinforcements had arrived and needed to be continually discouraged from advancing down the corridor, Doc was put on barricade duty, while Sister Valerie and her minions handled the packing and keeping Gravis alive. For the most part, between his entrenched position and natural kill zone, and his large supply of shotgun ammo, Doc didn't have much trouble holding off station security. In in fact, it wasn't even what you'd really call holding off. It was mostly a matter of popping a shot whenever someone peeked around a corner at the end of the hallway and shooting down the odd servo skull. The security officers that had been guarding the med bay weren't die-hard soldiers, they were just a police force, and their willingness to die gloriously for their station was rather lacking especially after some of them tried to rush Doc using a makeshift boarding shield and got pegged with some homemade tox grenade. Really just a glass jar filled with more tyranid biotoxin. Seeing half a dozen of your more gung-ho comrades die screaming and melting can really sap a man's enthusiasm. Unfortunately, this happy state of affairs didn't quite last long enough. Right as Amy's team was drawing close to the med bay, and had switched from blitz to stealth mode, the stationers found their spines and launched another serious attack. Or, to be more precise, they found a pair of gun servitors. We all heard Doc start swearing over the comms as the servitors opened up with a pair of heavy stubbers each and started shambling up the hallway while something like a dozen security goons followed a few meters behind. Doc made a good showing by all accounts, but the odds were stacked too high against him, and he was forced to abandon his firing slit. As the servitors drew into close range, he took a gamble and used his last tox grenade. He got a bullet in the arm for his trouble, but at least it was after he threw the grenade. The jar of tyranid biotoxin hit his mark, and quickly turned both servitors' fleshy bits into mush. Unfortunately, as the saying goes, if the enemy is in range, so are you. And several of the security troopers had brought concussion grenades. The entire barrage of grenades went off directly in front of the door to the storage room. The shockwave bent the door inward, ragdolled Doc across the storage room and left him pinned under the heavy crate he'd been using as a barricade. He was pretty definitely out of the fight at that point, but luckily, Sister Valerie was there to rescue his sorry ass. Now this is where things get a little fuzzy, because Doc was concussed, mostly deaf, bleeding both internally and externally, and is the very definition of a biased witness where his girlfriend is concerned. According to him, she calmly instructed her minions to finish packing, pulled the grenade off the mobile medical suite, and kneeled down in front of it. Then, head bowed in prayer, she extracted Sergeant Gravis's Astartes Mark V B Godwin pattern bolter, and started glowing with the divine light of the Emperor. We know this next part was bullshit, because Sister Valerie couldn't carry a tune with a bloody wheelbarrow and had actually been banned, very politely mind you, from participating in the choir during the occurrence border's morning services. 
but Doc was insistent that she rose to her feet, surrounded by a halo of divine light, and started singing a battle hymn so divinely beautiful that it was painful. Then, a singin' and a glowin' like a bloody angel, she walked over to the door and began mowing down wave after wave of security goons with Gravis's bolter. Now, we saw that hallway afterwards, and there definitely weren't enough bodies to constitute even a single wave, but we couldn't deny that she sure as hell shot the place to shit. She must have put at least three magazines of Astartes-sized bolt rounds down that hallway, though down really isn't the right word. The vast majority of the bolt craters we could see were along the corridor's walls, ceiling, floor, and somehow even the door behind her. She had about as much control over that weapon as a toddler trying to walk a Fenrisian wolf. Lack of actual aiming ability aside, though, Sister Valerie's counterattack got the job done. The sight of a tall, blonde bombshell incoherently screaming a sororitas battle hymn and firing what amounted to a fully automatic rocket launcher with all the accuracy and discipline of an enraged orc was more than the station security troopers could handle. They ran for it, and when she kept shooting, they ran some more. If the medbay hadn't already been evacuated by the head medicae, it would have been a lethal stampede. But as it was, the whole thing was just comical. The retreat ended with the whole cowardly lot sitting in the lobby, yelling at each other and trying to explain the situation to their superiors and the newly arrived reinforcements. By this point, those of us who'd been in the warehouse had navigated into an unoccupied maintenance corridor adjacent to the lobby. We were performing recon using Spot 2.0 and Fumbles. Seeing the idiots run out like there was a bloodthirster on their heels struck as h hilarious. And it got even better when they told the reinforcements what had happened. In their terrified little minds... Doc had grown to be some kind of Nurglite mega-cultist. We caught phrases like, What sort of hell plague melts bones? Turned a sister of battle into a demon host, and came here to resurrect his plague marine master. It was good stuff. Really lightened our moods. And on a more practical note, the horror stories had completely drained the security troopers' enthusiasm they pretty much unanimously decided to just defend the lobby and wait until one of the station's SWAT teams arrived. This was good news for Doc, who was in no condition to fend off another attack, but it left the rest of us with the problem of getting him out past 30-ish security troopers before the heavies arrived. Luckily, Sarge had sorted out his issues by then, and we were not forced to go with Tinks, or Emperor forbid, Nubbies proposed solutions. Sarge's defense of the office suite was not as exciting as Doc's desperate holdout. This was largely because the stationers knew Sarge was incredibly dangerous from the beginning, and didn't bother sending a few waves of poorly trained security officers to their deaths. Instead, they called for the station's best SWAT team, and set about fortifying the entire Telepathica headquarters to prevent any chance of escape or rescue. This sounded very bad to Sarge and the diplomacy adept, and they shared that opinion with Jim, who didn't respond except for fending Sarge off when he attempted to unjack the tech priest's mechadendrite from the comm terminal. There was a brief debate over whether he was okay, and if the try-and-cut-into-a-maintenance-shaft plan should be performed yet, since the cogitator adept said that Jim was, for lack of a better word, talking with over 50 other tech priests, Sarge decided to keep waiting, and set about fortifying the two-room suite. Then, once he'd reached the point where the suite was as fortified as physically possible, he calmed Twitch for some advice, then fortified it even more. At about the same time as Doc was wantonly employing Tyranid bioweapons against three unsuspecting security officers, the SWAT team finally launched their assault. Eight men, armored in matte black, void-sealed carapace armor, and wielding the best automatic shotguns the administratum could requisition, 
silently entered the main conference room and took up positions covering the door to the suite. One of them carefully opened the door's control panel, found the emergency override, and began counting down. At zero, the door slid open, but did not reveal the group of desperate heretics they'd been expecting. Instead, all that was on the other side of it was the sheer metal surface of the suite's table, and a lumpy object the size of a basketball, which had been wedged against the door, and fell into the main conference room as it opened. If the SWAT team had had time to inspect the object, they would have discovered that it consisted of six Lay's Pistol power packs, every extraneous metal skull, buckle, and stud that Sarge could rip off of his inquisitorial costume, and a few layers of duct tape. They didn't have time to inspect it, though, because half a second after it hit the floor, the improvised frag mine went off and killed half of them. On the far side of the massive pile of furniture, appliances, and bathroom fixtures that kept the table wedged against the door, Sarge felt incredibly relieved that the IED had worked like Twitch said it would. He raised his voice, and over the pained yelling of the two troopers who'd only been injured by the blast, Sarge told the survivors to bugger off. They responded by shooting the barricade a few times in a sort of desultory way, and then grabbed their wounded comrades and followed his advice. Now, if it had been a guard commander who'd just had his assault foiled like that, he would have said something like, Hmm, after killing so many of my men, they must be low on ammo now. Let's try that again. And Sarge would have been in deep shit. Fortunately, the people in charge were just civilians. And even better, they were a committee. When the SWAT team's survivors limped back to them, they sat down and had a nice lengthy debate about what to try next. Sarge and the diplomat listened in as idea after idea was raised and vetoed, usually for boring reasons like immense potential risk to personnel and property, but occasionally there was something more interesting. Apparently, the stationers were having a little trouble with their comms and cogitators, and no one from the Mechanicus was returning their calls. Eventually, though, the committee reached a decision, and unfortunately, it was a pretty good one. The Telepathica knew enough about their own headquarters to get into the ventilation system without a tech priest's help, and the shipmaster's union was able to furnish several canisters of sedative gas. Once Sarge and his heretical companions were incapacitated, they'd send in some men with lace cutters and rebreathers, and that would be that. Sarge immediately taped up every vent he could find, but did not feel especially confident in the ability of a single layer of duct tape to fend off a chemical attack. His nerves began to fray as he overheard the gas being delivered, then sent off to be deployed, and Jim still hadn't moved. The only thing that kept him from forcing the tech priest to wake up and trying to cut through the wall with his last two power packs was the old diplomat's calm assurance that he'd lose consciousness long before Sarge would, and could be used as a sort of final warning. Luckily, though it didn't seem so at the time, it never came to that. Right as the elderly adept started feeling woozy, Sarge noticed the telltale hum of a laser cutter and a spot on the wall of the partially flooded bathroom began to glow. Sarge spared a few seconds to curse the stationers for not mentioning that the assault was starting within the bug's pickup range, then got ready to go down fighting. As a sort of afterthought, he gave Jim a whack upside the head, partially to try and wake him up, but mostly because he was rather angry with the engine seer. Jim didn't snap awake, though. This was because he was already awake and was in the process of turning around when Sarge swung. The end result was Jim sitting on the floor, checking if his nose was broken, and calling Sarge some very unkind words. Sarge responded with a few choice insults of his own, but stopped when Jim pointed out that he was being very ungrateful for someone who'd just been rescued. When the lace cutter finished its work on the bathroom wall, the breach wasn't kicked open by a squad of heavily armed men. Instead, the precisely cut piece of metal drifted backwards, then disappeared up the red-lit shaft on the other side, revealing a small swarm of servo skulls. 
Sarge eyed the skulls with the special type of suspicion he reserved for anything that could be called good luck, but Jim assured him that they were friendly, and led the way into the shaft. As the engine seer entered, the skulls swarmed around him and carefully lowered him down the shaft. Sarge noted that none of them had stuck around to lower him, hefted the woozy adept under an arm, and slowly began descending the ladder at the back of the shaft. Up above him, the few skulls began welding the shaft closed again. After a very long and slow climb, Sarge found himself in what was obviously a Mechanicus shrine, and flinched as he realized that he was surrounded on every side by tech priests. The Cog Boys didn't seem hostile, though, so Sarge just stood still and tried not to look like someone who'd endorsed tech heresy in his subordinates. After a few seconds of motionlessness, Sarge noticed that none of the tech priests were actually looking at him, and followed their gazes to where Jim was chirping in binary at what had to be the local Majos. Jim's talk with the Majos went quickly, which was good, because Sarge was getting very tired of not being told what was going on. When Jim came over, Sarge got as far as, just what the hell did you before the old diplomat kicked him in the shin and suggested that he just let Jim take the lead. Using a haughty tone of voice that definitely didn't fit him, Jim began spouting a bunch of stuff about jurisdictions, reprioritizations, and other such weasel words. It was complete bullshit, but luckily Sarge was very fluent in bullshit. The gist of it was that Jim had told the Cogboys that he and Hannah had been given a vitally important mission by the Ordos Joris and name-dropped the two magi that we'd so memorably encountered. This was, of course, a very creative interpretation of being told to go gain experience in the Inquisition and we'll recruit you into the Ordos Joris if you survive, and Sarge took a small amount of pride in how much a cynical, lying bastard Jim had become. The local tech priests couldn't directly assist with Jim's mission without knowing what it was, or being given some sort of authorization from higher up, but they could definitely give him return to his ship. Furthermore, if he made sure it didn't threaten the station, they could make sure that said ship would be able to leave the system without being attacked. This was great news, but Sarge couldn't help but notice that only Jim and Hannah's escape and safety were mentioned, and pointed that out. Jim actually smiled a bit at that, and explained that the Cogboys had no interest in us at all, unless we did something to significantly damage the station. They wouldn't help us, but they wouldn't help the stationers either, and they wouldn't do anything to stop us from following Jim on his very safe trip back to the Occurrence border through the station's maintenance corridors. In the end, Sarge sent the diplomacy adept off with Jim, but didn't go with them because the dock situation was heating up and Twitch was handling things just fine by himself. As they headed off, one of the tech priests grudgingly showed Sarge to the nearest public corridor, then slammed the door behind him. Sarge was now standing in a sparsely populated public corridor, wearing a ragged inquisitorial costume and an evil goon uniform, which drew the eye better than a neon sign. Remembering the whole massive bounty on his head and station-wide arrest order thing, he ducked into the first unlocked door he could find, which luckily turned out to be a public restroom. He immediately stripped down to his skivvies and shoved the gaudy cult loathing into the nearest bin, then calmed the cogitator adept and set to work getting a less conspicuous costume. While he waited in the moderately filthy public restroom, Sarge listened to reports from the rest of us, and slowly formulated the most cunning of plans. A few minutes later, at about the same time as Doc was getting rescued by his girlfriend, a small-time merc who'd accepted a contract to remove an annoying drunk from a public restroom opened the door and got one hell of a surprise. Sarge was very gentle by his standards, so the merc would probably live. Though he probably wouldn't ever look at a toilet the same way again. Attired in a bad-fitting, not to mention rather damp and smelly, Merc uniform, 
and wielding a shoddily made stationer shotgun, Sarge stepped out into the public corridor and started jogging. A short distance away, two dozen mercenaries and bounty hunters entered a small dingy bar and looked around for the man that, according to the comm message they'd receive, had a lucrative contract for them. Now, it's been said, by just about anyone who's Sarge, that in the entire history of the Imperium, there's been no one so inherently a sergeant as him. He was born for it. Destined for it. It was as if the Emperor reached down and said, This guy, right here. He's gonna be the biggest, baddest, most sergeanty guy ever. And nothing can ever change that. He just sort of exuded sergeantness. And anyone with a drop of military blood in their veins noticed it immediately. Well, as Sarge entered that bar full of mercs, he turned that aura up to eleven. Sarge came through the bar door looking, despite his slovenly uniform, like he'd just stepped off a recruiting poster. And every man in that bar, including the bartender, came to attention. Sarge surveyed them for a few seconds, then announced that he knew where the heretic bounties were hiding, and that station security was too chicken shit to handle them. He'd called them here because they were the toughest, meanest, nastiest men on the station, and if they followed him into this fight, they'd also be the richest. Then Sarge turned on his heel and marched back out of the bar. The mercs, Bounty hunters and assorted scum in the bar all shared a look, then stampeded after him. A short while later, Sarge and his small mercenary army shoved their way into the medbay lobby and demanded to speak with the commanding officer. Unfortunately, the security commander, who turned out to be the guy Sister Valerie had tranked, was a bit less credulous than the mercs had been. He demanded to know who Sarge was, and no. Sarge is not a name, it was a rank. What's your name, Merc? What outfit he was from, and why he was here. Sarge, who knew from experience that claiming to be Sergeant Sergeant would result in a fair bit of wasted time, discreetly checked the name on his ill-fitting jacket, and announced that he was Sergeant Kelly. The men behind him were Kelly's heroes, and they were there to get rich or die trying. It took Sarge a bit of arguing to convince the security commander to let him launch an attack instead of just waiting for the station's second-best SWAT team, but he managed. It helped a lot that, despite the fact that the commander hadn't heard of any outfit called Kelly's Heroes, the databases at Security HQ had. It turned out that it was an accredited mercenary company, which was in good standing with the Administratum, Telepathica, and Shipmasters Union and it just happened to specialize in dealing with heretics. Imagine that. Anyway, Sarge convinced the man to let him lead an assault on Doc's position, which meant that he had a nice excuse to get up on a table and start giving a loud, impressive, and rather overlong heroic speech. Every man in the lobby turned their attention to Sarge as he stomped back and forth, talking about bravery and valor and all sorts of other heroic bullshit. No one noticed as a young man in a rumpled psyker's jacket sidled through the lobby's front door, around the edge of the audience, and into the hallway which everyone was supposed to be watching. They also completely failed to notice Spot 2.0 zipping in and out of the room, but since Spot was invisible, this was far less of an achievement. As Sarge's speech began to run uncomfortably long and the audience started to fidget, he received confirmation that everything was ready. He banged the table with the flagpole that he'd gotten from somewhere or other, and launched into the final, get-everyone-pumped-up part of the speech. Everybody's attention was neatly recaptured, which was good because while they might have missed the large blurry shape that entered from the hallway, it would have been hard not to notice when it turned into fumbles and the medical convoy and all the potted plants in the room withered. Luckily, after that little stumble, the convoy faded again, and no one noticed as it moved to the far corner of the lobby, where the wall was glowing slightly. 
Sarge's speech ended with a final bellow of, CHARGE! And every man in the room, both mercs and security officers, surged towards the hallway that led to the now-empty storage room. Sarge didn't go with them, though. As soon as they turned, he covered his eyes and bolted for the lobby's door. Up on the ceiling, Spot pulled a few pieces of string that had been run through the rings of a dozen flash and smoke grenades, and right as Sarge hit the doors, the lobby exploded into light and smoke. In the confusion, which quickly grew deadly as nearly fifty armed men panicked, no one noticed a section of wall collapsing or the large, blurry shape going through it. Sarge stumbled through the lobby doors, feeling rather proud of how that had worked out, and nearly collided with eight men in matte black armor. He froze for a second, resisted the urge to raise his shotgun, and told them that a bunch of heretics disguised as mercenaries had just attacked the security forces. The leader of the SWAT team swore and led his men through the doors. Sarge waited until the last one had gone through and sprinted like hell. As he reached the end of the hallway, a side door slid open to reveal Amy, and somewhere behind him, someone yelled, Hey, you! Something stung Sarge in the side as he ran the last few meters to the door, and Amy responded by leaning out and neatly putting a bolt of plasma through the offending SWAT trooper's helmet. Then, both of them were through the door. Despite the fact that the SWAT team following them had a nice clear trail of Sarge's blood to follow, they didn't manage to catch up. This was primarily because Amy kept shooting the control panel of every automatic door after she closed it, but also because any guardsman worth his salt is a good runner. Before long, they reached the rest of us. Sarge was tossed onto the loot pallet next to Doc, and the whole convoy rode out. The trip across the station went surprisingly fast and without incident. We later found out that this was because the station's tech priests were clearing the way for us by redirecting servitors and menials, and making sure every door was open. Apparently, Jim had convinced them that it was the best way to get us to stop cutting through things with Tink's plasma gun. Unfortunately, they hadn't been able to do anything to convince Twitch to stop being Twitch, and as we got closer to the west dock, the signs of battle damage mounted. Really though, anyone who knew anything about booby traps could tell that Twitch had been following Sarge's order to keep the body count low. There were a lot of bloodstains and the odd body part, but for the most part they were in the hallway leading towards the craters, as opposed to scattered around them. This was a clear sign of traps designed to act as deterrents instead of being set up for maximum casualties. Anyway, despite his restraint when it came to body count, Twitch and the ship's armsmen had really chewed the area around the docking bay up. It was a testament to the quality of the station's construction that the entire section hadn't lost atmospheric integrity. The Mad Bomber himself met us at the bottom of the freight elevator. Flanked on either side by the last two suicide skulls, and a pair of armsmen wearing the crutoid spine necklaces that marked them as some of the tribals from hydroponics. The second we reached the elevator, the two skulls zipped away behind us, and we all felt a shockwave and heard a crash of a warehouse's worth of crates dropping into the corridor. Sarge briefly considered asking Twitch how many other corridors he'd collapsed, and then decided that he really didn't want to know. As we rode up the elevator, Twitch brought us up to speed on how the defense of the occurrence border had been going. Apparently, largely thanks to the amount of flank Twitch's minds and skulls had been able to secure, and the resulting terror in the attackers, it had gone very well. Casualties had been low, at least on our side, and the captain had been able to launch a small offensive to liberate some much-needed supplies. The only really bad development was that the stationers had cut off the refueling pipe fairly early on, and no one had been able to figure out a way to steal any either. There was also the slightly worrying news that a few boarding shuttles had been launched by the station, 
The few of these that had landed in the well-populated sections of the ship were easily repelled by the armsmen, who had a rather significant home field advantage. But a few had landed in the tainted areas. Most of those shuttles hadn't taken off again, and Twitch predicted an increase in the amount of demon activity until those poor bastards died and stopped feeding the things. But the two shuttles that had taken back off were almost more worrying. They'd landed in the warp fungus bay, so by now the stuff was probably already spreading through at least one of the station's shuttle bays. Sarge calmed Jim and asked him to send everything we had on the fungus to the local cog boys, and we all hoped really hard that this wasn't going to turn out like the whole Necron thing. Two subsector-wide disasters in a row would be really hard to explain to Oak. After the elevator ride, it was just a short walk through some blasted-open bulkheads to our docking bay. As we arrived, senior armsmen started bellowing orders, and an orderly retreat started. Twitch watched carefully as the men fell back, and began pulling color-coded detonators off of his harness. One by one, the abandoned defensive positions were demolished, and everyone fled back aboard the occurrence border. Once we'd boarded the ship, we split up again. Doc hobbled off with the medical convoy to get Gravis back into his old bed and either help out with the wounded or get himself treated. The loot pallet was taken down to the Psyker holding cells, though Nubby, Fumbles, and several boxes fell off along the way, leaving Amy to help Tink, Theo, and Jim with all the unpacking. Twitch wandered off with his two tribal bodyguards to see about securing the entrances to the tainted areas. Finally, Sarge, who wasn't quite wounded enough to be able to justify escape to the med bay, trudged up to the bridge to see how our escape was going. Along with its usual staff of interchangeable officers, the bridge was occupied by the old diplomat, Hannah, and the captain, and the quartermaster. Sarge was struck by how calm the bridge was. He'd expected it to be as chaotic as it had been after first capturing the damn zoanthrope. But the most exciting thing happening was an argument between the captain and his quartermaster about the technical definition of piracy. Sarge noted that the captain was nearly covered in blood, which couldn't have been his given that he was still standing and the quartermaster's augmetic arm had gone missing, and made a note to ask them how their escape from the station had gone. When Hannah noticed Sarge's arrival, she cut off her discussion with the diplomacy adept, marched over to him, and launched into an angry lecture about how he kept getting Jim into trouble. Sarge bore this with his usual stoicism, at least until the tech priestess yelled at him for doing his stupid servitor impression and kicked him in the shin. As Sarge hopped around and cursed at her, Hannah stalked off the bridge and the diplomacy adept took her place. After he finished laughing at Sarge's expense, the old diplomat brought Sarge up to date. Hannah had explained the Mechanicus's neutrality to the captain, which is why the bridge wasn't in a panic. The occurrence border was headed out of the system, but since the tech priests on the station, as well as every ship in the system, were preventing the use of any anti-ship weapons, there was no need to rush. Sarge thought this was a dangerously optimistic viewpoint, but didn't feel like arguing with the captain. And anyway, it meant that Tink and the rest would have more time to repair the Psyker containment cells. Sarge was about to leave the bridge to see about having the buckshot removed from his side and changing into a uniform that fit and didn't smell of urine when the communications officer called them over. The station was broadcasting a message, unencrypted and addressed to him by name of the heretical false interrogator Greg Sargent, which turned out to be a vid from the station's leaders. Or more precisely, it was a vid from the choir master, the other two leaders mostly sat in the background and looked scared, and you couldn't really call it a message either. It turned out to be nearly 20 straight minutes of wide-eyed ranting and death threats, which went from frightening to amusing to tedious, 
then briefly back to amusing when the enraged astropath managed to break a blood vessel in his eye and had to be taken away to calm down. Unfortunately, the vid resumed after that, and the choirmaster shifted from pointless screaming to promises of vengeance. Among many other things, he vowed that every choir from Ultramar to Terra would hear of our crimes, which struck Sarge as a very petty and stupid form of vengeance. It'd cause immense annoyance in the short term, but it would ensure that the Inquisition found out, and everything sorted out that much quicker. Eventually, as the choir master ramped up to ranting again, Sarge got bored, told the communications officer to just send a copy to the adepts, and declined when asked if he wanted to send a reply. Then, with a wave at the captain and a promise to come up and help plan the route when the ship reached safe warp distance, Sarge left. A few hours and a much-needed nap later, Sarge headed back down to the Psyker holding cells, and found them empty. Just of people, though. The Zoanthrope was exactly where he'd left it. Thank the Emperor. Sarge flipped the bug off out of habit and checked the room down the hallway that Tink, Theo, and Jim had claimed as their break and nap room. He found the three nerds, accompanied by Hannah, sitting around a screen, watching their usual vile tau vids. Sarge eyed Hannah warily, but the cog girl did not seem inclined to violence at present. So he advanced into the room and prodded Tink. At first, the techie refused to answer questions, but after Sarge threatened to break the vid player, he became a bit more helpful. Tink confirmed that everything in the cells was working fine. They hadn't had the raw materials to just rebuild the cells like they'd wanted, but Nubby had gotten all the crucial repair parts. Everything should hold together fine for at least two weeks of warp travel, which was more than enough time to reach a less crazy Imperial outpost. Sarge recalled the cause of that craziness, and asked what the odds were of another astropath-killing psychic explodey thing. He got a lot of technobabble, which he assumed meant we're not really sure why that happened, but it probably won't happen again. His curiosity sated, Sarge turned to leave the room, but paused as something on the vid caught his eye. It was a fat man, wearing what Sarge recognized, thanks to some unwanted training on the subject, as floral-printed Tau formal robes. As the animated figure gibbered in Tau speak, Sarge realized that he was looking at some bizarre caricature of ex-inquisitor Lars Weebu, and with a dawning sense of horror, he realized what was going to come next. There was a blast of shrill music, followed by a few lines of text which Sarge hesitantly translated as Super Deserter Guevesa Action Heroes, and the scene changed to a group of six characters wearing Tau flak armor. Sarge's eyes scanned the horrible big-eyed characters for the telltales he knew would be there. There was a red cross on one, the bandoliers of explosives on another, and then there was a half-sized character with his psyker robe-wearing sidekick. At the back of the group, he spotted a character with chevrons who looked far grumpier and grayer than seemed appropriate. And finally, there was... well... It had the oversized plasma gun, and the goggles, and the drone, so it had to be, but... Uh, Tink? Why... Why is your character female? The techie froze, and slowly looked up at Sarge. Jim snickered. Ah, uh, well, you see, stammered Tink. Theo, seeing that Tink was having trouble, decided to help. That actually just happened. Last week, they were fighting the dread witch Yanai Geza, and she cast a spell which. Forget, I ask. 